Welcome to the Long Run Podcast. And no, this podcast is not about running, but this is the podcast about running the race of life. We're here to help you pursue Christ while navigating life so you can make life count in the long run of eternity. Hey, and guiding the conversation today is your favorite 22-year-old podcast host, Weston Downing, here to ask the hard questions we all have but aren't talking about. With that being said, here's another episode of the Long Run Podcast. Baby back, baby back, baby back. I want my baby back, baby back, baby back. Chilies, baby back ribs. Rachel, you know what that's from? The Don't Office. Lie. Thank you. It's goodness actually from a know. Chili's commercial, but. Is it really? Yeah, you didn't know that. I just want all our listeners to know that the criteria for getting on the show is you have to understand The Office <laughs> and know The Office. And, you know, I think I quote The Office more than I quote the Bible, and that's a conviction. That might be a problem. That really is. I'm not even trying to like, that's actually bad. Okay. In the midst of my (laughs) conviction, we are back with another episode of the Long Run Podcast with a unique special guest. Like I say, every week we have a new guest and every week they're special. So uh, Rachel Sharpie of the Sharpie Company. So her family owns like the Sharpie, like the markers, you know, that you write with, uh, that you always wanted to write with in school, but your third grade teacher wouldn't let you have. Stuck with the pencils back then. So, Rachel, tell us about how your family got into the Sharpie business. Um, well, Weston is lying, for starters. <laughs> so, let me give Rachel a quick introduction because I want a our... A real one this time. Uh, yes, a real introduction because I want our audience to know who we have on this week. Uh, but first, I want to start with where we actually met each other. I was on this three week oh, Lord. <laughs> little mission trip down in a country called Haiti. And uh, I was down there to do some videos for this organization called BGM, But God Ministries. It's yeah. stationed out of or headquartered out of, is it Hattiesburg? No, Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah. Hattiesburg. So we're getting there in a second. Uh, and Rachel it was over the Malnutrition Center in what was Galatian Bone, Haiti? Gancier, but close Gan- enough. So we have to give a shout out. We might have listeners there right now. I know, you might. <laughs> and might have them right there in Haiti. So yeah, I was doing videos and stuff like that, and Rachel was over the Malnutrition Center, and the rest is history because uh, <laughs> I had to record her testimonial stuff, marketing material, <laughs> and she loves being on camera. Oh. <laughs> Don't you love being on camera? <laughs> Absolutely not. When I wanted her to come on the podcast, I could just feel the anxiety come over her as I said <laughs> that. And then she said, all right, I'm coming to Memphis. And it was like probably 12 hours until we were about to record this podcast. She's like, hey, are you going to like send me some questions? <laughs> I was like, Rachel, I totally forgot you were coming down here. Well, gee, you think. Yeah, I don't know. Isn't that bad? So anyways, Rachel's quick uh, Twitter-length bio. She's a follower of Jesus, lived in Haiti for four and a half years, and her goal in life is to be a disciple who makes disciples. Gee, that sounds familiar somewhere. Mm. Where'd you get that from? Bible? The Bible. (laughs) Although you would say Robbie Gallaty. Yeah, I definitely would. So Rachel, tell our audience a little bit about your shelf, about yourself, shelf about yourself where did you go to college i went to william Carey university in hattiesburg mississippi and you studied music, music therapy music therapy okay what is that is you know what is that <laughs> <laughs> it's really just using music as a tool to help across a lots of different platforms help people meet goals it's cool you should look it up that's not what this podcast is about <laughs> so you graduated from college yes. uh what year was that 2015 graduated I, like gra- actually graduated mm-hmm. college yeah it took me a minute what year did you move to haiti 2015 oh the same year <laughs> i actually like walked i was done with school in 2000 like at the very january 2015 but i actually came back from haiti for graduation because i'd already moved really yeah so moved to haiti before you graduated right yeah technically so why Haiti? How did you end up in Haiti? How did God uh, move Rachel from technically Mobile, Alabama, but how, how, Hattiesburg? No. Well, yeah. Hattiesburg at the time. So how did God end up moving Rachel from Hattiesburg, Mississippi to Gancier, Gancier, Haiti? Um, that's an interesting story because I had no interest in 
international missions like at all really yeah um was very content to build my life in america i knew god called me to ministry but i thought that looked like church ministry Mm -hmm. not foreign mission field ministry but god broke my heart for the nations and that the gospel is genesis to revelation it is not one verse in the bible and that we needed to be a part of that that every every believer is called to be a a missionary whether it's in another country or you know wherever you are so yeah he kind of confirmed that with my first short-term trip to haiti which was um through our church our college minister had connections and so we went um and that was where god was like hey yeah i'm calling you to the foreign mission field (laughs) um so i knew i loved haiti and knew that I would love to go back and spend more time there. Um, just fell in love with the people in the country. But I actually talked to like a lot of different organizations um, about a lot of different places around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but Haiti is where ultimately God opened up the doors through But God Ministries mm-hmm. with just the perfect opportunity for where I was at that time in my life and just breaking down the barriers for things that were keeping me from going. And so, yeah. That's the short version, I guess. Yeah, so encompassed in your, you know, quote-unquote call mm, to missions and even specifically Haiti uh, was this desire, well, one, for the work, I guess, but for the people there. Yeah. Love the people. And then actually God opening the door for you to go there because I guess it's not a call until he opens up the opportunity, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. He definitely made it very clear. Um, Opened up some very specific doors that made it very obvious that Haiti was where I needed to go. So Haiti was your first short-term mission trip? No. I've been to Chile and Romania. Wow. And I'd done other, like, domestic. I'd spent a summer in Oklahoma as a summer missionary, and done. I actually came to Memphis my freshman year of college. Really? And worked at a church, yeah. What church was it? I don't even remember. That was so <laughs> long ago. <laughs> A lot has happened since then. Um, but yeah, so no, that wasn't my first short term. So what are three words that you would use to describe your time in Haiti? And the memories, as I ask that, are flooding back to my mind. I can think of just, and I was only there for three weeks, but we had we had a blast. Like, we <laughs> had a blast. It was, it, I was just a fly on the wall that first week to this American Haiti culture that the mission, y'all missionaries were living, and I was like... This is the Wild West out here. Like, this is literally the Wild West out here. I would ask you what you thought, but I'm a little scared of what your answers would be. <laughs> no, I mean, that's pretty much what I, sums up what I thought and <laughs> I, what I can say on this podcast. That it was the literal Wild West. I remember in the riding in the back of the trunk with the other missionary. In the trunk? <laughs> the truck bed, excuse me. <laughs> riding in the back of the trunk. The Haitian mob got me is what happened. <laughs> We were just driving to town, to the big city that one morning with Tony, the missionary. And I just remember looking. Yeah, I I think I remember that. We were going. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, this is crazy out here. I was like, there's literally a cow and there's these guys welding on the side of the road. Like, there's so much happening. Do you know one of the things I missed? I was thinking about this the other day because my tire pressure was low in my car. (laughs) I was like, I kind of miss Haiti where I could just drive up and, like, give them a you know some money and they would put air in my tires instead i have to get out in the freezing cold and myself <laughs> that's pretty funny I know. so three words three words to describe your four and a half years living in the country of haiti i don't think that's exactly fair that is that's three fair. words for four and a half years okay four and a half words for four and a half <laughs> years you take it <laughs> pick just, your poison on this one um i think obviously beautiful and but broken mm. And just paradox, I think, encompasses it all. Like, Haiti's just full of paradox. But so is life in general, isn't it? That was deep. (laughs) That was a deep ending to that. It really is. And honestly, beauty would not be my first word to describe Haiti. But you were there, and you saw the beauty of it from the people. Obviously, what people would take beauty at first when they think of going on a mission trip, they think of the geography. Uh, but the connection you had to the people and how that hits home with me, you see. And, I mean, I've been to – I've only been to Haiti and somewhere in Europe. But with Haiti, you see a people that have nothing and the happiness and joy that's in their life. Of course, it's hard. Mm-hmm. But you look at that compared 
to typically I'm going to play this card to Americans that maybe they walk in the grocery store with so many options, so many choices, and you're just like everybody's upset about the smallest, the tiniest <laughs> thing. You know, what I mean, we we take everything for granted, and I hate to play that card. It's yeah. like, well, you don't understand. You know, you don't understand. Which how, <laughs> was how I was after I came. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like. What am I going to – I'll just sell everything. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I don't exactly. know what I'm going to do. Uh, but with that being said, we're not really here to talk about your time in Haiti, but I want to hear a lot about your transition back to the U.S., mm-hmm. which I don't think we hear a lot about. Right. We always hear about the – typically missionary. We hear about the call. We hear about, oh, what moved them to go? Where are they going? You know, we, we clap our hands. We send them off. We get their updates once a month. They come back. They tell us what's going on. You need to come. You can do a trip. But we never hear about when they have to come back, which right. I, which is a hard conversation, I know. Yeah. Um, so when did you come back from Haiti? You were there four and a half years, left 2015. I saw you there, was it 2018? Good I goodness. think that... that was, mm, no, I think it was 20, yeah, 2018. Are you, yeah, I didn't go to 2019. Did you, are you sure it wasn't 2017? I went twice back to back, I think. <laughs> But the videos was 2018. Mm-hmm. 2018. So let's say 2018 for the okay. sake of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so 2018, you come back. What year? What month? September 2019. 2019. So tell us about um, as much as you can about that process about coming back. Um, it's yeah, it's complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely started feeling. I feel like God sometimes moves in our our desires. Um, yeah. And so. Just like the calling to the mission field, like I started to have a desire to live in another country and I never had that desire before. I noticed that I started to have a desire to live in America again, which was like really weird Mm because I never had that desire. And so I think that was kind of like a, okay, Lord, are you doing something? But, you know, just kind of brushed it to the side. And then Haiti just got very difficult. Haiti's always difficult, but like... They, there was a lot of political unrest that led to what they call pay lock, which is like country lock, wide lockdown, basically. What was and that again? Pay lock. French Creole, love it. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Um, but they would burn tires in the street or pull trees into the road or, mm. I mean, just any number of things. Um, and they, it would completely lock the country down. You couldn't go anywhere, which has its own world of difficulties that come with that especially when you're taking care of starving children and trying to make sure you have the supplies you need but um yeah so that started in July of 2018 and we were pulled out of the country a few times and I started to kind of feel like okay maybe it's time maybe God's calling me back and a lot of other things happened just um for me a lot we had a few missionaries that left the field um, that I had been really, really close to, and working in a malnutrition center, not every child uh, recovers, and so we had seen a lot of that recently, also. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just weary, honestly, but and but I didn't want to leave because I was weary. I wanted to make sure that that was the, what the Lord wanted for me, mm-hmm. um, if that was the case. So I honestly was waiting for my neon sign, um, you know, Rachel, mm-hmm. go back to America. And God never did that, really. Really? Um, I mean, I guess in a way he did. Like, my friends from the outside would probably be like, really, he didn't, Rachel? <laughs> Are you sure about that? <laughs> um, but, yeah, we got evacuated for the third time in 2019. I had already decided to move back to America. I'd had that, that hard conversation, was putting the systems in place for the Mount Nutrition Center to mm-hmm. run without me. I was supposed to move back October 11th, 2019. And then in September, we got evacuated out for the third time that year. And it was kind of like it was three weeks before I was supposed to leave. Mm. And so it's kind of hard not to be like, really yeah can make it three more weeks Mm -hmm. um but actually none of our american missionaries have been able to go back since then just due to um gang violence and some things like that so it's kind of like i mean i guess i say that god didn't give me a neon sign but i guess he kind of (laughs) did you know that it wasn't what i wanted though you know i wanted that happy getting to hug all my people and making sure our our what we had established was right. in a place that it could continue. Um, so yeah, I've got a little bit about how 
the transition right. happened, I guess. I actually ended up going back for one night, <laughs> um, staying close to the airport. I, so I left. When I left, I left my dog and my guitar, which are, like, <laughs> my two, like, my <laughs> prized possessions. I know that sounds ridiculous but dog and what's the dog's <laughs> name Yukon Yukon um so I went back for one night and um ha- had some friends that brought that stuff to me and uh that was kind of my last hurrah mm-hmm. in Haiti so you come back uh you moved back to was it straight to Hattiesburg Did you kind of yeah. bounce around a little bit Probably <laughs> I bounced went- around a little bit mm-hmm. I actually lived with my friend Aaron and her husband for three months. <laughs> and Aaron is in our live studio audience today. Aaron, say hey. What up? <laughs> yeah, what up, Aaron? Represent Hattiesburg. <laughs> <laughs> so you come back to the U.S. Now let's get into this transition. Now leaving was hard enough. Yeah. But I think the majority of what I want to ask you about is this time adjusting back to your home country. Mm-hmm. How was that? I mean, you've been back before visiting your parents and stuff, but was it different when you came back and then it's like, okay, I don't have a departure date, you know? (laughs) Yeah, it definitely was different. I think just trying to find my place and figure out what what in the world the Lord wanted of me Mm. now. Um, Also, I had a lot of baggage. I mean, I had four and a half years of watching some pretty intense suffering, of watching children literally starve to death and just walking some really hard roads alongside other people and not processing that when I should have Um, and having to come back and and heal Mm -hmm. myself and uh, just continue in my journey with the Lord too of Mm -hmm. like okay God what are you calling me to now yeah so during this journey from where you're at now to uh, you know where it took place, which, like you said, you were coming off the back end of a lot of things you experienced that were new to you, new to this girl from Hattiesburg, <laughs> Mississippi, thrown into the Wild West of Haiti to a country you love, to a people you love, but to a lot of heartbreak that you witnessed and experienced. And you're back in the U.S., back in what, Hattiesburg? Yeah, back in Hattiesburg. Back in Hattiesburg, where it all began, and you're like, what just happened? <laughs> so this journey, as you describe it, what was God and I guess currently is maybe what is he teaching you through that right now yeah Um, I can definitely say that it was a lot about embracing the hard things embracing the suffering and and just I hate calling it suffering honestly because there are people who suffer in such greater ways for the gospel Mm -hmm. um but it learning to embrace that and meet the Lord in the midst of it too. I think that we spend a lot of time, like I know for me, I'm just going to use myself for an example because maybe the general public isn't really like this and maybe I'm just weird. But No, please do. That's why you're here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're the example. I resisted. Like, I didn't want to feel all of the things. I tried my very best to keep my life busy and mm-hmm. to control, like keep, keep control of everything. So this is when you're back in the U.S. Yeah, back in the U.S., you know, and it's like working. this wave is catching up to you. Yeah. Now. Well, and usually what would happen is like I would have this week of like just being super busy, involved in involved in ministry, involved in church, involved with my friends, and then a weekend would hit and I would just be a mess of just, mm-hmm. you know, all of the all of the emotions. And sometimes I could pinpoint certain things, but other times it was just kinda I don't know, just hard, you know. Yeah. Um and thankfully I had a very good um person advising me that was like Rachel you have to let yourself feel this like you can't just push through it you have to let yourself feel it feel it and what I found was the more I let myself feel it the more I actually stopped and honestly I didn't stop the Lord made me stop because not only Mm -hmm. did I move back to America but then COVID happened so America honestly started to look a little more like Haiti than it normally does and so um, that was a whole different thing in it in itself. But I ended up actually having a friend that tested positive. And it's like very b- at the beginning of COVID when it was still taking days to get tests back. Mm-hmm. So I had a friend that tested positive and I had to go be tested. And I had to stay home until my results came back. Mm-hmm. And I just had to be still. And like just. You know, and that was really, I think, where the Lord really began to deal with me of like, Rachel, you have to stop. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, you can't control this. You can't 
shove it down. Um, and I love the story of of when Lazarus died and Mary and Martha and Jesus comes and you know Ma- Mary and Martha are weeping and they're grieving and Jesus sees them and Bible says that he was moved and he was troubled and that he Jesus wept with them and I think that he wept with them mm-hmm. that he grieved with them even knowing that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead um and that they had, but they also had to walk through that suffering in order to see this amazing miracle. I mean, we have record of like, you know, somebody just dying and Jesus raising him from the dead. Oh, they're not dead. They're just asleep, you know, and, and they are all of a sudden they're well. But that, mm-hmm. this is the first time, at least to our knowledge, that somebody had been dead for days. Yeah. And Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. But there had to be death in order for that there to be that miracle. Um, and I think Jesus meets us in that suffering and in that death and in that pain. And that was something I was having to learn and embrace. Mm-hmm. So the everything you're embracing in the midst of quarantine by yourself, the wave, I keep calling it, <laughs> has caught up to you. And, and like you said, suffering is such an interesting word to use. And we use it because the Bible specifically uses it over and over again, and that's how it labels. But, but what is considered suffering? What would you say? Because I think like there's one way to identify that. Of course, a, a Christian that's being martyred right, for their faith. Oh, no, that's suffering. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But is it? Uh, we talked about last week. Uh, you probably didn't listen to it, but we had a guest on Dylan for those that listened last week. And we talked about uh, being faithful in the little things and being faithful in the midst of suffering. And maybe even two weeks ago, suffering came up. But now we're we're approaching. But what suffering is, though? Yeah. Is it just when you don't have a job you want, or is it being martyred through your faith, or is it an umbrella term of difficulty? What would, what would you say? Of course, you don't have to give us the uh, the corner on the market of you know <laughs> suffering, but you know your personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I definitely think that suffering can be a broad term um, because I think there are very there are lots of different types of suffering and difficulty. I think sometimes we suffer because of our own foolish decisions, mm. and that is the Lord and His infinite grace bringing us back to Himself. Um, I think that we suffer for things that are outside of our control, too, and that that God still, in his infinite grace, is drawing us to himself in the midst of that suffering, dependent upon how we respond to it. And then, of course, there is suffering for your faith, for the sake of Christ. Um, so, yeah, that's my kind of overview of different kinds of sufferings that I, I think— I know there's more, but that's... <laughs> no, no, I thought that was good. And, and you mentioned it, but I want you to summarize it again. This time you're walking through in the midst of, of your suffering, or we can even use the word difficulties, because suffering is... <laughs> it, know, it, it's yeah. a... Because it makes it sound so much like, oh, I'm just a victim, you know, like... But whatever word you want to use, um, but we'll just we'll label it difficulties, because I think people can relate with that more. Mm-hmm. When you're walk, when you were in the midst of really just sitting in your difficulties, you know, and just the suffering you were feeling, and just everything that kind of caught up to you, the emotions, just the memories, I'm sure. Why do you think God was allowing you to walk through this? Obviously, like if you experience like trauma mm-hmm. from dealing with like starving children, and your heart broke from that, like that, that's just like a natural response. Like you know what I mean, like. Yeah. If you don't respond to that in any way, I, like I question what your heart is, you know, uh, or the warmth of your heart in that case. But but even other things, um, to broadly speak to it, because we have people, people are listening to this right now, and they're in, there's no telling. It's all across right, the board. Yeah. Um, from I mean, we're in a global pandemic, so it could be anything from loneliness to death to anything, mm-hmm. but even more so just in normal life because you know COVID-19 is really just wrapped up life uh, but there's still everything else that's going on in life so people are in every different situation imaginable why do you think God allows us to walk through suffering because the word says he will use uh oh, what's to say it I'm, I'm getting cluttered in my mind Romans he works everything for the good of those who love them essentially is what it says mm-hmm. I need to memorize that verse apparently uh <laughs> Essentially, though, he yeah. works everything for the good of those who love them. I don't know about you, Rachel, but me sitting in my difficulty, or if I'm you and I'm in quarantine, which I was, but I just played Call of Duty. I didn't really, <laughs> you know, God was probably trying to teach me something. I was like, well, you know, I was just play Call of Duty. Uh, but, <laughs> but you're sitting in the midst of your difficulty, 
why can't God just make it go away? Or why can't I just, you know, some people may say, well, you just need to pray more. Mm. So go away. Or you need to read your Bible more. You know, pray it away. Like, why do you think he lets us walk through it, sit in it, mm-hmm. even? I think there's I think there's multiple answers to that question. I think first off, and one of the things that I witnessed most in Haiti is that suffering is a product of sin, um, that this world is broken, and this is not the way the Lord intended it to be. I think it's Romans 8 that talks about how all creation is groaning and has been submitted to, like, this brokenness, not... And it, it, it says, I don't have it memorized, obviously, mm-hmm. but it, not because of of that creation chose it, but because of us, because of he who submitted creation to it. Um, mm-hmm. And that, you know, one day all of this suffering is going to pale in comparison to the glory that we will behold. Um, so that was one thing that in the midst of Haiti, in the midst of seeing all of that suffering and, and saying, why God, <laughs> you know, that this isn't the way he intended for it to be. Mm-hmm. But, on and um, on the other side of that, too, I think God has lessons for us to learn in the midst of our suffering. Yeah. Also, I mean, yes, he has lessons for us to learn, but also I think there's just a fellowship with him that we don't experience outside of suffering like there is a nearness to the lord that does not come in just easy walks of life and i think that that is when i mean james says that consider it pure joy when you Mm -hmm. face trials of many kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And I know, like, that's one of those verses that we all quote and we all say, oh, well, you can should consider it joy when you suffer. Mm-hmm. But we, and, but not to sound insensitive, but we should consider it joy, not because of the suffering, not because of what we're going through, but because God is working in us to make us perfect and complete. And that is what I should take joy in and find joy in. But also that Jesus meet like, there's a there I think there's a fellowship in knowing that Jesus meets us in our suffering, and I think that's the thing that I've experienced. And it, I think it's kind of hard to put words to even because it's not something tangible. It it's just His presence with you in the midst of it. Um, I love the story again of um, of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, mm-hmm. and it's I mean there's just all of these people at the at these pools because they believe that an angel descends you know so often and stirs up the water and the first person into the water is healed and so jesus comes and out of all of these people he sees this one man and it says you know he knew he had been there i can't remember 37 or 38 years that this man had been sitting there and jesus walks up to him and what does he ask do you want to be healed well, duh, Jesus, what do you think, you know? And the man says, but, and the man's very next thing is like, but there's nobody to take me to the water. Mm. You know, I've been laying here and, and everybody beats me to it. And so basically like, there's no hope. And Jesus says, get up and walk, <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. And that, but I think that's so pertinent to our own healing in the midst of suffering too, is sometimes following Jesus means well following Jesus always means obedience but sometimes it means doing things that don't make sense you know well that man had to trust Jesus to get up and walk he could have been like meh you know that's not possible I can't get up and walk but he trusted Jesus in that moment he got up and walked and Mm -hmm. experienced a miracle um, that Jesus met him in the midst of his suffering when Jesus healed the lepers it says he touched them he didn't have to touch them. They were lepers. He could have just said, be well, and they would have been well. But it says Jesus reached out and touched them in the midst of their suffering. And so I think that in the midst of our suffering, if we will allow ourselves to slow down and to really experience it, and as painful as that might be, that there is a sweet fellowship with Jesus that only comes in the midst of suffering. That's a lot. That's good. 
That's so good, though. And that should be our response, though. Easier said than done. Absolutely. That's, that's I think, a lot of things we talk about on here. But <laughs> but absolutely, that should be our response when we're hurting, when we feel abandoned, alone, rejected, whatever it may be. Uh, we read a quote before we started. When we think about uh, Jesus uh, going to the cross, like the only way he could pay for the sins of the world was because of his deity and his humanity. And through his humanity, he was the, the perfect uh, lamb to pay the price for our sins. Like if he had sinned, he wouldn't have had a bank account, a bank account big enough to pay the sin debt of the world. Yeah. But not only that, what did he experience going to the cross? You yeah. know, you think of the verse that's in scripture, we'll cast your anxieties on him because he cares. When he was in the wilderness, he experienced temptation. Mm. So he can relate with us on that factor. And, and God didn't have to just come to earth uh, through Jesus Christ so he could, you know, experience everything. You know, he, he could have, you know, paid. Well, of course, he had to come to, you know, pay and die on the cross or whatever. But it was it was because of God's love for us. Not only did he pay it, but in the fact through humanity so he could relate with it. You know, so through temptation, but even going to the cross and feeling suffering that I'll probably never experience mm, yeah. through torture, physical pain, but even where the father had to turn his back on him mm. and the abandonment and the rejection he had to feel as he took the wrath of God on the cross. And, and we say that because the only way you're going to get through suffering is this relationship you have with Christ. You'll live. Yeah, right. I mean, you'll live if you don't go crazy. I mean, after you run to everything else. But that's something we really have to realize. And so when you say, okay, welcome the suffering. Uh, well, in response, I like how you said it when we were having the conversation prior to the podcast. How we re- should respond to suffering is not to run from it, but embrace it. Mm-hmm. And not embrace it because it's fun. <laughs> not like it's, it's a workout. I'm like, oh, this will make me better. You know what I mean? That's not what you're right. thinking. You're like, this is awful. You know what I mean? I can't sleep. This is what I constantly think about. Mm-hmm. I feel like I can't even go on to do, you know, ministry or anything like that. Anything productive. I don't even want to work out. But running to Christ, and which is, you know, we use terminology like that. But, you know, people sometimes, like I said, they'll say, well, you need to read the Bible more. You need to pray more. But really, you need to cast your anxieties on him because mm-hmm. he cares. Yeah, absolutely. But does it instantly go away? No. I mean, I don't. I mean, well, that's think about the, the man at the pool. At the desk. He'd been there for 37, 38 years in the midst of his suffering, you know. Um, and I don't. I think it's a process. Um, I definitely am not where I was at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are still moments, you know, I still have my days uh, that are hard. But I love um, I love Elizabeth Elliott and I love Corey Ten Boom. And they are way more qualified to talk about suffering than I am. Mm -hmm. Um, but their faith that stood in the midst of it, that didn't shake their fist at the Lord, but said, Thy will be done um, in the midst of it. And it, I mean, if you look at both of their lives, the suffering didn't end, you know, and I think it's, there's always going to be suffering in some shape or form. Yes, we'll go through good seasons, but we also go through hard seasons, and that's just a part of life. So, it might be a longer season and it might not be. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just so there again, like there's so many different types of suffering, but right. And reasons why we suffer uh, yeah. to quote John Piper. If I could give three reasons, he said of why we suffer and he has scripture to back this up. I just don't remember what it was. <laughs> didn't even write it down, uh, but you can look it up on desiring God reason for suffering or desiring uh, But what he said, three reasons for suffering. There are five, but I put three, <laughs> three reasons, repentance, reliance and reminder Mm -hmm. the first two strike me very hard because well the second one reliance i think is really what we're talking about right is that what you you felt like in your situation was it more of a reliance on god or what do you think i definitely think that yes that was what i was learning in that time is is even in a season that should be physically easier that i I'm dependent on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Reliance would yeah. be. 
and then even like you said, if you do something stupid on your own self, then you're going to feel <laughs> that's the repentance. <laughs> yeah, you're going to feel the natural consequences because that's how God has uh, right. ordained order and creation, and uh, it's time for you to repent. Right. Absolutely. And then I think uh, as reminder as well of maybe He wants you to even sit in this reliance and remember the good things He's already done. Um, but if you could speak one last thing, and you've said it, but I want you to summarize it. If somebody <laughs> which, you know, is sitting in the midst of this suffering, which to say, obviously the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, number one teacher for us, uh, walking the Christian life. What I would say right behind it in experience uh, form, in experience form, the greatest teacher would be suffering Mm, behind the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Um, Because that'll bring you to your knees. Mm -hmm. And it strips everything else away. Like mm -hmm. in the midst of suffering, like, Every, there's nothing else, you know. I think it removes a lot of our distractions, honestly. Right. So if you could speak to somebody who's in the midst of suffering or difficulties right now, uh, how would you encourage them or, yeah, encourage them with how they should respond or what they should do if they're trying to just to turn to other things they just have nowhere to go? What mm-hmm. would you say? I definitely would say um, let yourself feel it. Like, don't fight. Don't fight. Also, there's no shame in going to counseling. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I feel like some people need to hear that Um, because that can definitely be a turning point too. And embrace it. Don't push back against it. And let the Lord meet you there. And be encouraged in knowing that he grieves with you. Jesus, again, like we just already talked about, is not a stranger to suffering and he will grieve with you that's a good word that's awesome well rachel do you have anything else you want to share about the topic of suffering <laughs> or any uh funny memories you have from haiti uh, oh, I could, lord i'm gonna have to censor what i have uh because they're it's not that they're bad it's just <laughs> i don't want to share them on here I'm a little scared about. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to share them on here. Well, do you have anything else you want to add before we, before we go? I think that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. Well, awesome, <laughs> Rachel. I'm so glad you finally got to make it here in Memphis, me Tennessee. Yeah, it's been good. Come here and record with me. We've been planning it for two years. Her <laughs> agent finally <laughs> got with me the other day, and I was like, "Yeah, can we get her on a jet down here?" And she was like, no. And I was like, well, Aaron, just uh, see what you can do. Okay, make the magic happen. <laughs> and then she's got her bodyguard, Jordan, in here with her as well. Uh, so I'm don't, pretty important. Don't mess, with, don't mess with with this crew. So shout out to the live studio <laughs> audience today. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of the Long Run Podcast. As always, find us everywhere you find your podcast on digital platforms. And on Apple Podcasts, you can rate and review us. Oh, and if you like watching video, we're on YouTube. <laughs> Check <laughs> check us out. This video. <laughs> well, this video we had the one camera, so it's a weird angle. But thank you guys for listening to another episode. And as always, we'll see you next week. Boom. We're out. Woohoo! You killed it, Rachel.